Dragonflies and damselflies have been around for a very, very long time. They watched our ancestors crawl out of the water and witnessed the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. They've flown over lakes and rivers for the last 330 million years. What is the secret of their extraordinary success? Perhaps it is because they're completely at home in two worlds. Below the surface, their larvae are deadly hunters. And when they've eaten their fill and grown to full size, they crawl out of the lake, change their shape, and take to the air. But that's only part of this story. The real reason for their long reign over planet Earth can be found in their daily lives, in behavior as complex as that of many birds and mammals, yet normally unseen. So let's spend the summer by this particular lake and watch closely. The little creatures really do have the biggest stories to tell in the world of dragons and damsels. sun, the lake is getting busy. The reeds are alive with dragonflies and damselflies. A miniature soap opera is about to start. And one of its brightest stars is a little damselfly with a big role to play in the coming drama. The Common Blue. Common blues are both very common and very blue. A colour so intense it seems to glow when it catches the sun. And in the world of dragons and damsels, common blues are real characters. Damselflies are smaller and daintier than dragonflies, but they have an attitude way bigger than their size. Common blues are always bickering over the best lakeside viewpoints. And their huge bulging eyes enable them to hide behind a single blade of grass and still keep watch on the neighborhood. A picture of peace and serenity. But to survive here, a damselfly is going to need more than those sharp eyes. It needs equally sharp wits. They may have brains less than the size of a pinhead, Yet common blues lead a surprisingly complex life. Females are not such a brilliant blue, but when one of them visits the lake, she soon gets noticed. There's no romance, a male simply pounces on her and with no ceremony, hooks up. And this one has made it, just.
There's stiff competition for any single lady, and she doesn't stay single for long. He clamps himself to her thorax with claspers at the very end of his abdomen. So far, so good. But now, he has a problem. His reproductive organs open at the end of his abdomen, and so do hers. So in this position, he can't actually mate with her. But he also has a second set of reproductive organs, a kind of holding pouch halfway up his body that he is already filled with sperm from the main sex organs at the tip of his tail. But it will take some extraordinary agility for the pair to consummate this union. The female now has to swing her abdomen forward so that she can reach up to collect the sperm from his secondary organs. And he tries to help her as much as he can. the mating couple form a romantic heart shape. But there's a ruthless side to this tender moment. The male's secondary sex organs are not only storage pouches, they also contain a device unique to dragons and damsels. It's a probe with two hooks on the end. With this, he's able to scoop out any sperm that she may have acquired from her previous mating, and so ensure that he will be the father of her young. And now the male needs her to lay her eggs quickly before another male comes along and scoops out his sperm. He tries to lift off with the female still attached, but she seems reluctant to leave, even with the male at full throttle. He tries to persuade her with a sharp bite to the head. But no, she's clearly not impressed by him or his pickup technique. And there are plenty of other males around. All she has to do is to wait. Here's another male. She nips her first partner's tail and after all his effort, he gives up. And she flies off with her new partner. Males will jump on any female they spot, but females are much more choosy. Her former partner's sperm is scooped out, and the new couple fly off together to lay their eggs. Undaunted, our lonely male sets out to look for a more willing partner. But he can't afford to be too preoccupied with the opposite sex. He really needs to watch where he's going. It just isn't his day. 
A wasp spider has built her lethal trap in the reeds, in an excellent spot to ambush unwary damselflies. And she wraps her victim in a shroud of silk to stop him struggling. And his short life is over. A large lake like this is home to more than 20 different kinds of dragonflies and damselflies. But not all of them will spend their whole lives here. Both dragons and damsels are great travelers, flying high and covering long distances in their search for water. Their eyes can detect polarized light reflected by water surface, so they can spot a pond from a long way off, no matter how tiny it is. This lily pond in a garden might be small compared to the lake, but it's been discovered by these intrepid explorers. A tiny realm reigned over by an emperor dragonfly. Dragonflies are more powerful and agile in the air than damselflies, and they defend their own territories around lakes and ponds, engaging rivals in aerial dogfights. But this intruder is a female, and the male dragonfly finally realizes this. So he now grabs her and hooks up in midair. Now, they must perform the same gymnastics as damselflies. They can even fly locked together like this, but after mating, they separate and the female goes off to find somewhere to lay eggs on her own. She lays her eggs inside plants, but she's very choosy about picking exactly the right place. The carefully tended lilies in this ornamental pond are just right. Sometimes, in her quest to give her eggs the best chance of survival, she decides that the perfect place is a long way below the surface of the water. But she doesn't mind getting wet. A dragonfly can tell a lot about both water quality and the submerged vegetation from the way that polarized light is reflected from the surface. So, although the whole pond looks the same to us, discerning emperors quickly home in on the most suitable spots. And one egg-laying female soon attracts others. Egg-laying emperor is noticed by the local common blues that also use the pond. But why? Are they just curious about these lumbering monsters? Possibly. But back on the big lake, where there are vast swarms of common blues, this behavior seems to be much more than just curiosity. As soon as a female emperor lands on floating vegetation to lay her eggs, she's surrounded by clouds of common blues, buzzing her, mobbing her, harassing her even landing on her and biting. Her. 
Eventually, it all gets too much for the female emperor, and she gives up. Why do the common blues risk their lives chasing a dragonfly that is much bigger than them, and could easily kill them? Probably because of what those emperor eggs will become. Eggs hatch into larvae, and emperor larvae are killers. Lethal predators. Damselfly larvae are right up there at the top of their menu. Those sharp eyes spot any movement. And the emperor larva stalks its lunch like a tiny cat. Its eyes are huge, and both face forward. So the lava has a stereo vision. It can judge its distance from a target very precisely. And when it's close enough, it deploys its secret weapon. Jaws that can shoot out an additional half length of its body, a long range strike capability that, for the damselfly larva, comes out of nowhere. The jaws snap shut, and the damselfly is impaled on sharp spines to be hauled in and chopped up by a pair of serrated blades before being swallowed. It's hardly surprising that emperors and common blues don't get along with one another. But don't feel too sorry for the damsels. They also are killers and use the same tricks as the bigger dragons, just on smaller prey. Water hog lice, slow moving, abundant, the perfect meal for a growing damselfly larva. And damselfly larvae are just as stealthy as their bigger relatives. Softly, softly. Just waiting for the hog louse to move. field under the surface of a tranquil pond is no place for the faint-hearted. And there's something else lurking down here, too. Something hidden in the dead leaves on the lake bed. The larvae of darter dragonflies. Squat creatures that look like bits of dead plants. They are ambush predators and well camouflaged. But these larvae have stopped hunting. 
They are about to join the emperors and common blues in the air above. And even the ugliest lava turns into a beautiful dragon. A common darter dragonfly, as elegant and colorful as any emperor. Like emperors, darters defend territories around the lake, but they do this in a different way. Male emperors sometimes take a rest on a convenient perch, but they spend most of their lives on the wing. They patrol their territories from the air, hawking up and down, occasionally hovering to survey their domain and check for intruders. Darters are less energetic. They find a convenient perch to keep watch and every now and then fly off to check out their territory, often coming back to the very same spot. Sometimes they pick the flimsiest of perches. but they have the poise and balance of a ballerina. All dragonflies are true masters of the air. They can hover, rock steady. They can fly backwards. And turn on a dime. These extreme aerobatics depend on very sophisticated wings. Wings that have corrugations for strength and complex patterns of veins that allow each wing to change its flapping ankle independently in flight. But exactly how do dragonflies achieve their aerial skill? Ready when you are. At the Royal Veterinary College in London, scientists are trying to find out. Here, Richard Bomfrey uses smoke trails to reveal the complex patterns of airflow over the wings. and he studies the way wings move by filming them from every angle with multiple high-speed cameras which slow down the action 80 times. Well, this is a very nice takeoff sequence of this data. We can see that the wings twist and they bend and they change in camber. Each of the four wings is being driven independently. So sometimes the fore and the hind wings are flapping together in phase. And after a little while, it switches to counter stroking. So it's uh, flapping out of phase. Now we have nine cameras here. And what all those views allow us to do is to make a three dimensional model of the dragonfly's body and the wings as they undergo all these shape changes, the bending and the twisting. So we can begin to understand how the dragonfly controls its flight. 
If we now understand how dragonflies achieve such mastery of the air, can we do any better? Scientists at Festo in Esslingen in Germany have tried. A team of engineers here spent many years trying to build a robotic dragonfly that mimics the dragonfly's natural flight, as Elias Knubben explains. We tried to come as close as possible to the real dragonfly. We did a lot of research, how do they adjust to different surroundings, how do they steer, and I think we came quite close to the functions. We are able to control the movements really precisely. It has to be adjusted in, in really very short time, so it's only milliseconds actually that you have time to react. Festo's Robo Dragonfly can fly, but it takes a skillful pilot controlling it remotely just to keep it in the air, let alone make it turn and twist as elegantly as the real thing. The pilot has to control nine different aspects of the wings at the same time, far more complex than flying a helicopter. Yet real dragonflies do this with a brain the size of a pinhead. This robot dragonfly is an amazing achievement, but it still doesn't come close to matching a real dragonfly. To be honest, real nature is even much better. It's not only really uh, pretty much smaller, but it's also, it has even much more functions. And there's so much more to learn. Uh, we're looking forward to do this. But to be fair to Festo's engineers, real dragonflies have been practicing the art of flight for 330 million years longer than they have. And in that time, nature has come up with more uses for wings than just flying. These particularly beautiful wings with deep blue patches belong to a banded demoiselle. Banded demoiselles avoid the busy lake. They prefer flowing water and live on a nearby river. Unlike most damselflies, banded demoiselle males occupy small territories strung out along the banks of the river, and they defend them in style by flicking their wings showing off their colours, and so signalling ownership of their exclusive riverside property. Banded demoiselles are created equal. The wing spots vary in size. This can be hard for us humans to spot, even comparing museum specimens side by side. But the differences are quickly picked out by those sharp damselfly eyes. The fittest males have the biggest spots, and a rival with smaller spots soon realizes his place and gives in gracefully. But if a male with similar size spots tries to take over the territory, a different strategy is needed. A fight with an equal could be dangerous, 
It's better to just behave like gentlemen. So each male shows off his spots with exaggerated wing beats until one of them finally accepts defeat and retreats. Other males from neighboring territories join in, and they all sort out the neighborhood hierarchy between themselves. For an insect, this is really sophisticated behavior. Each male is able to decide the best strategy to follow based on his estimation of the toughness of a rival. Summer is now reaching its height. And back on the big lake, more and more dragons and damsels crowd into the reeds. These are four spotted chaser dragonflies. And they gather in huge roosts every evening to wake at dawn, ready to find somewhere to claim as the territory. Not easy when there are so many rivals. Space in the reeds is now at a premium. But that's not a problem for another species of damselfly that has now joined the throng the common red eye. Red eyes perch on anything floating on the surface, no matter how small. Each a captain of its own little ship as it drifts over the surface of the lake. But they also sometimes get unwitting help from bigger residents of the lake. The feather from a swan makes an excellent raft. and the red eyes defend their little boats against the ever inquisitive common blues. A flick of the wings, a warning, there's no more room on board. And there's not much more space in the reeds, now crowded with males just hanging out, waiting for a female to turn up. And when one does, she turns a lot of heads. With the season in full swing, there's a lot of desperate males around. seems available. But this is an azure damselfly trying it on. He might look like a common blue, but he's a totally different species, and he simply can't hook up. Now, a red eye tries his luck. This is definitely not going to work.
Finally, a genuine common blue, and her patience is rewarded. In these crowded skies, a male has only one mission, to attach himself to a female and stay attached. It's the best way to avoid another male mating with his partner. But it looks like hard work for the female. Though a male does have his uses. To find the best spot to lay her eggs, a female damsel must sometimes submerge herself completely. Being smaller than dragonflies, she can get trapped by the surface tension of the water. The male, however, stays dry above the surface, and that can be important. He may be needed to haul her out of the water if she gets into difficulties. But if a female gets too wet, even the male's assistance may not be enough. Males don't like getting wet. And if a female submerges particularly deeply, her mate just abandons her to her fate. Now, she's on her own. Without a male to help, it's a real struggle to clamber back out of the water. As long as a male stays attached to his partner, no other male can steal her, and he can be sure that he will be the father of those eggs. But all these single males don't just give up. They constantly hassle egg-laying pairs. And if a pair crashes onto the surface, the male might drop his mate before he gets soaked. And then one of the single males can grab the female. But this time, they've picked an unusually feisty male. He hangs on, even though he's now stuck on the surface film himself. They're so busy fighting over the female, they're getting careless. And all this activity attracts the attention of monsters from the deep. edible, trapped on the surface. This male has somehow avoided becoming fish food, but that was his good luck used up for the day. His struggles create ripples, and for the creatures that live on the surface film, that is like sounding a dinner bell. Skaters can detect these vibrations and pinpoint their source precisely. Swarms of them home in on the helpless damsel. They pierce the damselfly's skin with their sharp mouth parts, inject a digestive toxin, 
and then suck up nutritious dragonfly soup. Great flotillas of pond skaters patrol the lake's surface. And they're never short of food, for the female damsels have to settle there if they're to lay their eggs. But both dragons and damsels spend as little time as possible near the surface. Darters, however, manage to lay their eggs in flight, just touching the water briefly. Darters do this as a pair, a display of precision flying that human engineers can only dream of. With each dip, the female releases a few eggs. Eight wings and two brains working together. The slightest miscalculation would end in disaster. Damselflies have a different strategy to avoid the dangers of the lake. Egg-laying pairs, like these azure damselflies, often gather in large numbers. So there's less chance of being the unlucky couple if a predator does show up. This male has sensed something is wrong and is desperately trying to pull his mate from the water. But however much he flaps, he can't take off. And this is why. An underwater predator, attracted by the crowds of busy damselflies, has bitten off her abdomen and made a meal of it. Her mate is still trying to rescue her and fly her to safety, but it's too late. The others carry on egg-laying as if nothing has happened, paying no attention to the unlucky female who just manages to haul herself onto a lily leaf. Always on the lookout for a single lady. A common blue thinks he's found an opportunity, but soon realizes his mistake. She is mortally injured and beyond rescue. creatures, raindrops are as dangerous as cannonballs. Time to find shelter.
But the season is nearly over, and time is precious. As soon as the sun returns, male demoiselles are back on their territories. It's now almost autumn, and while other damsels and dragons are winding down, one kind of damselfly is just getting started. An unusual species that's attracted a lot of attention in recent years, the willow emerald. In the last few decades, this species has moved steadily north through Europe and has even made the hop across the North Sea and invaded England. The British Dragonfly Society have been keeping a keen eye on the spread of these invaders, as Fiona McKenna explains. The willow emerald damselfly arrived in roughly 2007, so when we got the first record of a female in the UK. Their rapid invasion of Northern Europe is a consequence of climate change, which is why it's important for scientists and naturalists to chart its spread. It's a marker that can tell us how a warmer climate might affect the natural world. And the spread of the willow emerald is easy to track because of their strange lifestyle. It's quite unusual. It's different to other damselflies. Um, you have to look up in trees for it. Traditionally, it's associated with willow, hence it being called willow emerald. But it has been known to utilize other types of trees as well. And it also lays its eggs into bark as well. It's got very unusual egg laying behavior. The female has sharp blades at the tip of her abdomen, which she uses to cut holes in the bark of trees. They leave very distinctive little oval scars where they've laid their eggs into. The scarred branches are easy to see. So you don't even need to identify the damselflies themselves to follow the species spread northwards. Of all the dragons and damsels, willow emeralds are among the last to take to the wind. And they must work quickly before the frost arrives. Autumn brings the stories of all dragonflies and damselflies to a close. Lakes and rivers seem deserted. But not so. Below the surface, the next generation, the legacy of those frantic matings of summer, are waiting, ready to take to the air when the weather warms again, as they have done for the last 330 million years.